Hello and welcome to Media Academy Online's Film Diet Podcast. I'm Dana. And I'm Brandon. And in this podcast, we're going to be talking about anything cinema related. First off, we'll talk about Disney Plus, which is their streaming service, Mm. which is getting launched next year. Later, I think for the US, it's later this year, end of year. And then for us, for us in Australia or the Pacific area, it's like next year. Mm. But even like they've, they've created, they're creating their own TV shows and films. Uh, They've got two characters from Avengers. Yeah. With their own TV show, which is going to be, I think, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah, and I think there was a few that was announced. Oh, totally. Yeah, there um, would be. That's the only one I can remember. So it, <laughs> uh, it's interesting to see how they're going to treat their new streaming service. Whether it's just a, this is where we put the characters that we still want to keep around, or whether it's this is where we're going to try different things and new things and mm. see how they hold up to an audience. Well, I guess those new TV shows are a good testing ground for them. Yeah. The new Star Wars series, Mandalorian. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is going to prove to be it's a, it's a good move on their behalf because they're going to they're going to succeed. Yeah. And the the good thing is that it's it's good to have a major studio say, "Look, we understand where the industry is going." Mm. And we're not going to just try and fight Netflix on this. Well, I hope that's not their plan of taking over that bloody streaming service as well because then they'll be yeah. owning the cinemas owning the streaming yeah. service it's but, just too you know, much it'll, it'll, fucking Disney. it would be sad because Netflix have done so well yeah, to this point they're doing really well mm. and they're trying new things and they're not afraid to try new things and which some, is cool some, some of their stuff's pretty bad but <laughs> at least they're giving they're, it a they're crack they're giving it a crack yeah. there, have, there have been some right wing ones that I've watched though that have been really Good. interesting mm. and they're not afraid to say hey we're just going to try something different because it, what, what is it to us Yeah. and it's that whole model where it's we don't have to make half a billion dollars on this film because it's just going to support our streaming service mm. and build that and make that more of an experience for people. And once we've got we've got them on that service, they're just going to keep paying the ten bucks, whatever it might be, a month. Yeah. And that kind of seems to be where the industry is going. And I think it's it's good because it means we can try new things. Mm. And, and instead not, of just sort of like uh, this rep- repetitive cinema experience, yeah. which is like you know it gets old quite quickly. Watching things in the comfort of your own home when you want is the best that the film industry probably could ask for. Yeah. Because they, all you're doing is you're giving them money, you know, for a subscription and they've, they're in your home. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to go to them. They're already in That's your right. life, 100%. And, um, yeah, once once you've once they've subscribed, chances are they'll stick around. Yeah. As long as as long as you've got creating new content, ex- new content and new experiences for people. Yeah, it's like Netflix. I've hit points where I'm like, should I just cancel it? But I always come back to it just to see what's on there anyway. Yeah, 100%. you know. And it's like, well, what's the point of canceling? I'm just gonna have to join again, so I'll just stay on it. Yeah. Even if I haven't watched much in the last month, I'll just keep it going. You know? Especially when it's like half the price as a DVD here or a Blu-ray oh, yeah, here. Yeah, totally. Um, Ridiculous those prices for like my collection's three hundred plus, and I could have probably bought a house by now. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> That's the thing. And I mean, here we've got a store called JB mm. JB Hi-Fi, where they st- still sell all that stuff, which is great. But I always go in there and walk out with too many DVDs that I didn't need to buy. Oh, I used to do that <laughs> weekly. I've actually had to force myself not to do that anymore. Yeah. And I, it was just a habit. It became like a an addiction or something where I was like, I just enjoyed it. I just enjoyed that because I used to do it back in the, in the day before streaming services. So it was just like, that's how you yeah, get your movies. Even movies that... You know, like independent films or obscure films. You know, there's only one way you can watch them if you didn't illegally download them was to buy them. And, you know, I'd buy a movie and, you know, without... And maybe watch it once and then it just on the much sits on my shelf for yeah, five years it. before I pick it up and go, oh, I might watch that again. Yeah. And then but sometimes the issue is you can't be bothered getting up off the couch <laughs> to go... Put the disc in or the, yeah, or the old videotape. No, yeah. no, I don't use that. But anymore. I mean, that's the, that's the other interesting thing is how long are they going to stick around for? 
Because um, the, uh, there's some people out there that reckon it's only going to be another two years. Pers- two. Personally, I think it'll be a bit longer than that. Five minimum. But, yeah. Ten. Because they're still selling. They might get a lot smaller over the course of the next five to ten years. I could see that. Where they start having less titles and only the bigger, bigger titles. Yeah. You know, are around. You know, the films that don't sell, in other words, would just start disappearing. Even uh, Disney, with their bigger films, they said they're going to put theirs onto Blu-ray and DVD first before they put it onto the streaming service. Of course they are. So they're going to milk that too. Um, Well, that doesn't bloody surprise (laughs) me because the prices of Disney on Blu-ray or DVD are always higher than everything else. Yeah. Five bucks more or whatever, you know, yeah. always. And I put some shiny foil on it or yeah, something. Yeah, not it even. <laughs> Just having the Disney logo on it does yeah. that. And I worked in Sanity in Dick Smith. I worked in retailers. that We sold DVDs and Blu-rays. And Disney stuff was always more expensive. Mm. And they'd run special times of the year where they'll have specials on their stuff. But it was still expensive. And even then... Like with their classic cartoon animated films like Bambi or Little Mermaid, uh, Aladdin, Lion King, they'd make them unavailable. They had this thing called the Disney Vault. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that only now they've said they're not going. That's not going to be a thing anymore as soon oh. as their streaming service comes online. <laughs> Cheeky <But>, buggers. <laughs> no, yeah, the Disney Vault was. I mean, brilliant marketing oh, move. That's who. That's what they are. They are the marketing. Yeah. Pigs. They're not, it's not a mouse, yeah. so it should be a pig. For those who don't know, the, the Disney Vault is basically where they'll have a, a film. Say Little Mermaid, for example. Say Little Mermaid, mm. and they would, they would not sell it anywhere for... Stay off the market. For a certain amount of years, and then they'll bring it out for a... For a limited a certain, time. Limited time, and then, oh, goes back in the vault. Yeah. And it won't be touched for another X amount of years. Yeah, and we used to get a chart of when these titles would be released again. So it'd be like, when I was working there, Lion King got re-released. Um, that's the main one I can think of. And it sold so many copies. It's re- and they had like three different versions on DVD, you know, one with your digital version. And then it cost like 40 bucks. Wow. You know, yeah. that was five, six years ago. And imagine yeah. like... It's, it's interesting that they can do that. Because think of a film like, let's just say, Transformers 3. Yeah. If they try to do that, that'll be the end of that film. No one will care. <laughs> no. But because it is such iconic films that they've produced, they can do it and people will still buy it. Buy I've got it. this kind of... Disney have won over us families, you know, and kids and mums. You know, not so much dads, I don't think. Maybe us are growing up watching... Lion King and Aladdin and all the that. Have, we have that nostalgia. But I, I used to see it. Disney have this stranglehold on family entertainment and respect or it's like this, it's either Disney or none or Disney's just always top tier. It's like the platinum children stuff, you know, whether it's the toys, the, yeah. the merchandise, you know, and they've just worked that so well. It's crazy. You know, they've won over your hearts and then your fucking wallet at the same time. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's the... Go anywhere. You know, it's, it's hard to go a, a day where you haven't seen something Disney. Mm. You know, just go to the shops. Disney everywhere. Whether it's like in your supermarket. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah, it is. Um, and even like, we're in Melbourne and mm. we've got a Marvel Stadium now. Oh no! How weird is that? And that threw me when I heard that. They're totally. Like, it's going to be now now be called Marvel Sta- Stadium. Mm. But and now they've got a Marvel store in there where they're selling Marvel products, oh. and it's they're really any the nothing's nothing's off limits for them. Wow! Soon they're going to be ha- you know you know they do like the Lion King live Broadway shows and yeah. stuff. Are they going to start doing massive events? You reckon? Where it's like they would just have a whole stadium, like a whole Disney bloody festival. Yeah, they well, could almost do Disney, that. Disney Con. Yeah, yeah, Disney Con. Yeah, there won't be any more Comic Con. Yeah, <laughs> that'd <laughs> be like that'd be in like some backwater factory. Yeah, they can have DC <laughs> stuff on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we we both grew up watching Disney, like pretty much ninety nine point nine percent of the population, and raised on it and. 
Disney were in a weird spot in the 90s, you know? Yeah, very weird. After Lion King, they just could not land another successful hit after Lion King. For a King. long time. For yeah. ages. And they were they were becoming um, like a second-rate second, second rate company. Yeah, yeah. You know? And you could see that because they were just re- releasing all these um, straight-to-DVD sequels. That all just bad and TV yeah. shows. That's mm-hmm. that was like their main focus, but it kept in the population's conscience that way. So it wasn't a complete loss for them. Yeah, because they bounced back even harder. Really, yeah. I mean, and and that bounce back was really that was thanks to Marvel again, before Marvel. Oh P- yeah, Pixar. Oh, purchase, of course. purchasing Pixar. Yeah, of course. Which um, that's probably that was the it goes um, down to the business decision again. The mm. brilliant business the minds they're saying we we're struggling here we want mm. to create those nostalgic experiences for people mm. what who's doing that pixar pixar and then they already had a partnership they did prior to that yeah which fell through and then they yeah. had like this back and forth thing yeah, for a that's while right. yeah um and but again that was probably one of the best moves they could have done in that time is just say we're going to buy you out absolutely you're um, right there that was yeah. the best move they could have done and and thankfully Steve Jobs, who had funded Pixar at that stage, mm. said, "Okay, you know, I'll, I'm willing to talk to you guys about that." And mm. um, that was kind of the beginning. And then that meant that John Masada, yep. who's got himself in a bit of trouble at the I moment, heard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, he's not even he's like off doing his own thing in another animation yeah, company now. Right. But we won't go into that. Yeah, that's a discussion for another yeah. day. <laughs> but um, him then becoming the head of Disney Animation, yeah, which was part of that whole buyout, was that he was going to head Disney Animation. Okay, um, you can't deny that John Lasseter is a storyteller first yeah. and foremost, yeah. and he can look at any any story and mm. he can make it successful. Make it successful. Pixar was such a strong company, and they were just knocking it out of the park, one after another. They had this awesome rise to this, to you know, to win the top spot of 3D animation or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Over DreamWorks and all the other competition, they they were just the classiest one, you know. Mm. And then what happened? Disney bought them, and then they started dropping, yeah. didn't they? To, the way I see it is that the, as soon as they bought Pixar, Disney bought Pixar, there was kind of like this shift where the films. Disney were doing, there was all of a sudden a big focus on, on those Disney mm. branded ones. It's and, almost competition with themselves. Yeah, and they're, and they're where they're basically saying, we're actually going to try and create decent things. And they worked out, I don't know, they, they, I guess they said, we're going to put story first mm. and we're just going to try and create the best film we can, headed by John Lasseter, yep. who was able to say, all right, let's create something that works. And then it was, yeah, as you said, it was like a competition between themselves. Because they have movies, for example, like Zootopia. Yeah. Or I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but Big Hero 6 was, yeah, was another one. that was a good one. Um, yeah, and they're not bad movies. Don't get me yeah. wrong. They're still good in their own merits, but it sort of becomes a bit um, like people, the common person or the average person would probably assume that some of these films are Pixar and likewise, you know, because they almost... There's almost like that's what happened to Pixar. They became yeah. almost the same as those movies. And that's the thing. Like you will hear people just on the street or wherever it might be talking about something like Cars, mm. and they're like, "That's Disney." And yeah. it's like, well, technically, mm. it's it's it was created by Pixar. Mm. Obviously, they own that IP IP now. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's kind of where everything that was once. Pixar is now Disney mm. and that's kind of the brand where you know this is where I find it a bit like I don't I don't blame them and I don't I can't and I don't hate them fully but it, uh, this is what I'm talking about with the Disney coming back to it the Disney snowball the Disney domino effect where it's just like they they're like they're almost like the eaters of the industry you know yeah. like they're like they're kind of like Galactus from from Fantastic Four. He eats planets, and this this entity is eating up all these IPs. You know, with potential from Star Wars, Pixar, Marvel. 
you know, they're just like slowly and quickly actually. And I was surprised that they actually, like the government allowed for that Fox purchase. I was, there was for a while there, everyone was like, oh, I don't know if they'll let it go, mm. let it through because I mean, they do have a say. Obviously they don't want a monopoly on their hands. Mm. So they, you know, it has to go through the various um, channels to okay. get approved yeah. before it happens. Right. So it's interesting that well, that one didn't did go like through. Thousands of people lose their jobs at Fox. Yeah, yep. That's ridiculous. It. How bad is that? That's horrible. So yeah, I am actually a, a hater. Yeah. Put me on that list. I am a lover and a hater. It's it, it's right. <laughs> like from the get go, I knew that was going to happen. Like how many? You can't double up on various job roles. Mm. It's going to happen. And so if they if they the same thing happens in the future, that's Which it will. What's going to happen? How many? You know, accountants can you have? Mm. You can't sort of keep everyone on. Yeah. Which I understand from a business point of view, but it is sad for those people who have worked so hard in a certain job role, whatever mm. it might be. Building this company up. Building or... the business, the company, the mm. business, and then, sorry, we've been bought. See you later. See you later. You're going to have to go to Warner Brothers and beg or yeah. to Sony. And, or until the same thing happens to them. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, how long have I got? So I just joined Disney now, the Empire. They really do suit having Star Wars under their banner because they are the Empire with their Death Star. Yeah. And they're blowing up all the planets. <laughs> Warner Brothers Planet, you're next. Getting away from that bleak, negative topic, let's get back to the passion of film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other films I've seen recently would be Bumblebee, because that's fresh in my conscience. Yeah. Like, I just rewatched it last night. I saw it at the cinema. Um, not the biggest Transformers fan, but once again, nostalgia yeah. and all that. And that film, I was going in for it thinking, okay, here we go again. But I, I think they did all right. Like, I'm not going to put it on my, no. my, my top film no, list, no. but it stood for its, by itself as a, as a film, you know? They, they actually said, we're going to put in a basic story and keep it, at, at the story. Peeled back, yeah. Um, so, you know, personally I thought that's probably the best move they could do. So let's try and not focus on... Effects heavy. Yeah. Well, you know, too much of that. I, I don't know the full Transformers, um, sort of the whole history of them, mm. but from my research, they actually put effort into making sure the characters, the Transformer characters actually looked like their yeah, well, earlier, their cartoon counterparts. Well, I can confirm that to an extent because I used to watch the old animated movie more than the, the series. I remember watching bits and pieces of the series when I was a kid, but yeah, it was more the, the animated film that came out in the 80s, which I used to hire on video all the time. And they had, that was amazing. And they and they got those Transformers right, you know, like Starscream, um, Jeez, I can't remember all their names now, but, you know, Optimus Prime, let's go for the main ones. Um, yeah, and just that opening scene yeah. where I was talking to a friend about it and he was like, holy shit, holy shit, every time a character mm. would come on, he's like, yeah, oh my yeah. God, that's the character, that's the character. Yeah, yeah, I had those toys, you know, yeah. when I was a kid. I was like, wow. Um, so just that experience. Soundwave. Yeah. There's a character called Soundwave and he's got this, he's got this voice. From, it's just exactly the same as it used to be from the old cartoons. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, you've got me. Because I've been waiting for that. Because the Transformers and the, the Michael Bay ones were just unrecognizable for the most part. Yeah. You know, and even when they're moving, you're just like, what is going on? All I'm seeing is shiny metal all over the screen and I can't work out what's an arm or a leg or yeah. if he's Decepticon or Autobot or Shia LaBeouf. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, just 100%. too much for me, you know. Yeah. But yeah, that was a good film. Yeah, no, I, I thought it did all right. Mm, you know? Not brilliant, but a good film. <laughs> it's a it's a good step forward for the franchise, anyway. Yeah, good, it's uh, kind of st we're going to take a step back and we're just going to peel back. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> some other movie. Oh, uh, some TV shows I've been watching recently. Obviously, Game of Thrones, which you haven't actually. No, I haven't. I'm actually <clears throat> one of the few completely fresh to it all. Which is, I find that. Um, you know startling because 
90 once again most people have seen yeah it, you know and so i'm kind of seeing the whole the backlash for this past <laughs> series yeah. from an outsider's point of view and everyone's so mad i'm like whoa yeah i mean from it's justified I'm not, uh, you know I, to I, an extent i can't crazy comment on why like who what when where mm. of it but it's just interesting to sort of see mm. um not knowing a single character mm. um but i guess the benefit I got now is that I can go into it and watch it from beginning to end without mm. any breaks, pauses, no breaks, nothing, or whatever. It's up to you. Binge it, and that's the thing I found about that's that's one of the things about Game of Thrones. I think because there was breaks in between seasons, you had to wait a year or two. That's you know, and that created hunger. Yeah, you know. So when I was watching, that's what made the show better in retrospect. When I think about it, because season one you know i was watching it as it was coming out you know and i just could not wait for the next one and i haven't been like that with a tv show pretty much ever yeah, yeah. you know i can't i've never been an avid tv buff like that, there was x files and you know seinfeld and you know there's tv shows out there that i loved and i liked and thought were okay whatever you know but i was never like someone that was like oh i've got to i must watch this Get your so hook. the yeah. day it comes out i need to watch it and then wait for the next one and just waiting and waiting and waiting and the season's over cliffhanger and you're just like oh my god i gotta wait a bloody year for the next the continuation yeah so game of thrones is the only one i can think of really that did that to me but as the show went on and on and on it got less and less and less Mm-hmm. You know, especially the last couple of seasons. I was more curious to see where they were going with it rather than what was happening. Yeah. And it got to a point now in this last season with each episode that was coming out, I was just like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Okay. Oh, shit. And I guess from an outsider, I can ask you the question, mm-hmm. do you think it's because they've destroyed the, the story or do, is it because it's ended? They destroyed it. Yeah. Yeah. They literally lit it on fire and just walked away because they, the whole idea of the show in the beginning, right? Because it's, it's based on such dense story, law, books, you know, and it's so thick. It lays it on thick on you, you know, mm-hmm. and you're there remembering names, characters, places, you name it, you know, things that happen off screen, on screen. You know, there's just so much to, it's like reading a bloody book at times. Yeah. But the more it went on, obviously they had less content to draw from from the book. So then it got watered down. That's the feeling I got. And the last two seasons, yeah, it was like, all right, how do we just end this now? And I heard that HBO wanted them to do more episodes, like 10 episodes they wanted them to do in the last season. But they were like, no, 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 we're just going to do six. Ah, oh, so they only did six. Okay. Six bloody episodes mm. when their normal was 10 plus. Yeah. Okay. The last two seasons combined was 13 episodes. So it's basically one season split across two, mm-hmm. you know, in contrast. But yeah, they definitely... Because they built so much and so much behind these characters over five plus years, you know, and you're thinking, wow, this show is massive. The scale felt massive. The world felt massive. And then the last two seasons happened and things just are different to how they used to be. So like characters would jump around. Um, things used to take ages, in other words. Like a character would have to travel from one spot to another and it would take a whole bloody season. That's okay. how what it felt like, yeah. you know. It was actually like that. Or, you know, things were drawn out, but it was interesting. And you got a sense of reality from it. And all of a sudden that was gone. And it was just like a character here, there, 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 there. And yeah, it just got really condensed. And they just basically, you could see that they just wanted to end it as quick as possible. Right. And they, I know I've heard yes and no about this, but I heard that they are taking over the new Star Wars trilogy, right? Okay. They're the guys that are supposed to be writing this new one. I heard that because um, they got given that once Game of Thrones ended, I was wondering, did they just want to wrap it up quickly mm. and sort of get onto this next project? But I was thinking maybe this is what Disney's done. Maybe they said, no, you must... This is just me being stupid and crazy, but I was okay, thinking, just putting this out. is, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. I thought, because I heard all that foil, stuff. Foil hat on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Conspiracy theory, you know. I was thinking, hang on, has Disney almost forced them out? Yeah. Because okay. they might have said, we want you to do the new Star Wars, but you must be working on it by this time. Yeah. 
this is what I was thinking in the back of my head. And I thought that could be a fucking reality because they got the streaming show uh, coming out end of the year. Game of Thrones would be their biggest competition. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, how do we cripple them? HBO, how do we cripple them and sort of get, get take away their best asset as we're coming in? Food for thought. Do you think that is just coincidence or is that... Because how can something so good be so good for so long and then you're coming to the end and they just go, oh, screw it. We'll just, we'll, we'll just ride it half ass and not spend time okay. on it. That's the impression I got. Yeah. Well, Conspiracy, I mean, as, once as an again. outsider, I, I have to withhold any comment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess we'll leave it there and uh, yeah. the viewers can decide what they want to... Yeah, people will bash yeah. me and send think us, I'm crazy. Send us an email if, if uh, you want to <laughs> comment on that and we'll talk about it in a future yeah, podcast. Yeah. But the other good show is, in contrast to Game of Thrones, let's get off that now, Chernobyl. This should be on the tip of everyone's tongue soon, if not already. And this is a show that's a mini series. Um, it's on HBO as well. It's only six episodes about a real event. So Chernobyl, the, um, you know, radioactive plant uh what do you call it like what homer works at yeah Yeah, the power plant (laughs) meltdown massive disaster in the 80s Mm -hmm. and it is the way the show is being made from a filmmaking um sort of standpoint is i'd give it high praise 10 out of 10 very good again uh, this is this is one that i come into very (laughs) see see, i Personally, I tend to watch a lot of film, mm. not as much TV, which is great to have someone else here who does watch a lot of TV mm. um, to, have a, to have another point of view. Probably too much TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. but yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's just, you got to watch it. If there's anything I can recommend, it might not be for everyone because it makes it feel sick. It's, it's a real, the way the sound design is impeccable. Um, the mm-hmm. score, the score in it, this female composer, and she's doing the new Joker movie, which I'm mm-hmm. very interested to hear because mm-hmm. the, her mu- work in music in this sh- series is just phenomenal. And it creates a sense of dread and, and, and the, in the soundscapes she's using and the synthesizers and the electronic uh, distorted synth work and noises that she's u- using in the music really gets under your skin and really represents the radiation because you can't see it. You can't see radiation. So it creates this... Wow. Oh, and yeah. it just it just makes you feel like, oh my God, this is horrible. Right. This is so bad. How do you represent something you can't see? Exactly. Yeah. And this, my, my brother, because we've been watching it together, he finally brought up The Happening, the M. Okay. Night Shyamalan yep, movie, yep. and mm-hmm. said, this is how you do something that you can't, a threat that you can't see properly. Yeah. Whereas The Happening is the one that, is unsuccessful in that mm-hmm. because it's, it's laughable and stupid and silly. And it's because how do you get under the skin without seeing it's, it's audio. Yeah. It's 100%. The, the, yeah. The, the senses. Yeah. Anyway, Chernobyl top stars. Yeah. Not for everyone, but it's great. Uh, the other one I've gotten back onto true detective season three. Okay. Um, I don't yeah. know if you've seen any true detective season one. Yeah, I've seen the early stuff. Yeah. I loved season one, but yeah, season two wasn't as good. But season three, probably, I'm only a couple episodes in, but it's definitely better. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested again. Once again, another HBO. And Barry's the other one. So comedy. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, which I've spoken to you about, which is great too. Mm. And anyway, yeah, some good stuff. Very good. Yeah. I think I've ra- ranted and raved long enough. What do you reckon? Good. You got anything else to <laughs> rave about? Um, um, so one one thing I've, I've that's sort of in the recent memories, the one that I saw, extremely wicked, shockingly evil, and vile, uh, which is the ten, Ted Bundy story, the story of Ted Bundy. Is it a biopic? Uh, it is, um, but the the sort of focus on mainly the court case part of oh. the story. So they oh. they sort of start it have a very quick bit where you see Zac Efron meet his future wife mm. um, and they kind of sort of get to... It's, it sort of begins of as a bit of, a bit of like a 
sort of happy family kind of story where he's a normal person and they hang out and she's okay. got a child and he embraces the child as his own right. and it's all it's all quite friendly and happy mm, but and then, then there's this yeah thing. and there's just something and then by the end of it you're just like holy shit what has gone what has been what, happening yeah. really behind the scenes and and it, it's that kind of the idea where it, it's what they don't show which okay. leaves you questioning what's going on yeah right okay well that's interesting that's a good angle to sort of do something like yeah. that i think and they they give you glimpses throughout it and you're like holy shit this <laughs> is not the character we know and that's uh. the i remember when the trailer came out reading the comments on youtube mm. there was a huge backlash because they're like these guys they are misrepresenting this guy this guy's a horrible vile person and mm. yet they're they're painting painting him as a as like a family as, man or something, as a suave, you know, Handsome. ladies man. Mm. Um, I think that's what was interesting is that he was able to have this persona mm. as a you know a ladies man, and all the girls loved him and would believe anything he says. Oh, okay, but deep down in real in real life, that wasn't him. Wow. But he was able to fool them. That's what was interesting about the film, is that yeah. they said, we're going to embrace the fact that he looks like an everyday man. Mm. But he's actually not. Cool. That's a good spin on the whole serial killer film. Yeah. Yeah. Without seeing someone that's monstrous, someone that's the other way, which is like, yeah, it's a surprise, isn't it? That would surprise mm. you while you're watching it. You're kind of like, oh, and then they'll create this kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah this uneasiness. Well, I guess that'll be it for today's podcast. Make sure that you keep an eye on our YouTube channel. We'll have more content coming soon. Till then, adios.